Hi, I'm Mark Brumley. I'm here with Father Joseph Fessio, the founder and editor of Ignatius Press, and we're going to talk about the election of Pope Francis, or should I say Pope Francis the first? I know Francis that's a, the first. That's yes. a controversy. No second, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, when John Paul the first was elected, he designated himself as John Paul the first, and that was the first time a first ever designated himself that way. So. It's tradition now. It's tradition. By yeah. the way, Mark is the president of Ignatius Press. He's the one that does everything. No, not quite. Uh, Father, uh, here we are right out of the gate, the day of the election. What are your initial thoughts? Well, this is unprecedented. This is the first time in this millennium, in this century, in the last couple of decades, that a pope has been chosen who is not an Ignatius Press author. Wow. I mean, this Gee. is really a step into you know, the unknown for the church. Uh, <laughs> if he prays real hard, maybe he can become he one. He does pray, but however, he makes up for it by being a Jesuit. Mm. Uh, and incidentally, not only a Jesuit, but he was a master of novices for a period of time, which is a sign usually in the society of someone who is a man of prayer and who is gifted at the formation of young people. So we have a pope that has experience there. He also was the rector of a seminary, uh, and then he was uh, provincial of the Jesuit order in Argentina. So he has the experience of both spiritual direction and administration. So that, that's good. Yeah, very good. Well, you and I have both been responding to media inquiries. You do a lot more than I have. What are some of the questions that the media uh, pose to you about this pope? Well, one interesting question I was asked by a reporter from the Houston Chronicle, whatever his name is down there, uh, uh, with respect to the fact that no one really foresaw this particular candidate being pope. And she asked me, is there a message there for the media? And I said, well, yes, don't trust the media. <laughs> uh, when it comes to the workings of the church, it takes place on a level which is not political. It's partially political. It's an incarnate church. Sure. But it's also spiritual. Those cardinals wanted to do what they thought was best for the Catholic Church and be open to the spirit. And I think this is a brilliant choice, a brilliant choice. You know, the Pope's real title is Pontifex Maximus, which in Latin means... Maximus, the greatest pontifex, bridge builder. This pope, by his very being, is a bridge builder. He is of the old world. Right. His parents were born in Italy, by the way, near where my parents were, grandparents in near Torino, immigrated to Argentina, so he's part of the new world. He is someone who is doctrinally very sound, supports the church's teachings in all the controversial areas, and at the same time, is socially compassionate. He's interested in the poor and in the developing world. So he unites those two things. Uh, he takes the name Francis. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask you about well, that. I, because that's a topic of some discussion. With Benedict, people were discussing well, what's the significance of that following John Paul II. What about Francis and the Jesuit background here? Exactly. Well, first, it's brand new. It's a, it's a step into something totally different because there's been no Pope Francis before this time. Clearly, the initial reaction one would have is that St. Francis of Assisi sure. is the great saint of the poor. And we know that Cardinal Bergoglio lived a very simple and poor life. He didn't live in a palace. He lived in a little apartment. He didn't drive a limousine. He took the bus. He cooked for himself. He really tried to be a man of the poor and not just someone who had interest in the poor. But there's also, I think, a very important symbolic act in Francis' own life, namely uh, that famous event when our Lord from the cross spoke to St. Francis and said, Francis, rebuild my church. And Francis took it literally, he began to rebuild this church in ruins, but then realized, no, Christ was asking him to rebuild a church in crisis, a church that had become too worldly, a church in which the poor were abandoned, uh, to some extent, the church has always had her ups and downs, but clearly Francis was called at that time in history, the 13th century, to rebuild, to restore, to edify, in the best sense, to build up the church. And then thirdly, uh, the Pope is a Jesuit. And of course, uh, the day the conclave started, which was the 12th of March, was the day that St. Francis Xavier and St. Ignatius of Loyola were canonized by the Catholic Church. And St. Francis Xavier, of course, is the greatest of the missionary priests of the Church's history. Went to India, went to China, and was a man of great zeal. So I think that 
uh, Pope Francis I, like his predecessor, Benedict XVI, has a great sense of symbolism. Here we have a Pope who is taking it as his model, uh, the great saint of the poor, the cheerful saint of the poor, the saint who is called to build up God's church, and after whom was named a saint of his own order to be a missionary. So I, I just think it's a tremendous symbolic you know, name. And there's a third saint that some people are talking about, St. Francis Borgia, who was also a Jesuit, well, one of the sure. early leaders of the Jesuits. So, and, and of course, a very, very uh, timely figure in that kind of Reformation period. A very good point that is too, yes. And of course, our friend, Father Frank Felice, is named after Francis de Paola, who's a different Italian saint. So he's not sure uh, exactly what the Pope's intention was. He thinks it might have been to be uh, patronized by St. Francis de Paola. <laughs> well, perhaps, we'll and perhaps he'll come and visit us here in the city of St. Francis. Yeah, and get some Paola. I think, uh, it's, a, <laughs> I think it's a problem he's probably trying to deal with. But, yeah. um, Father, uh, now you're, I know you, you sometimes see yourself as long in the tooth. Uh, I don't think of you as that. Uh, but we'll, we'll at least acknowledge that you've been around a while, longer than I have, and you've seen a number of popes. Um, some, for some Catholics, you know, they haven't known a lot of popes. In, in fact, I, I, was, I was watching uh, Colleen Carroll Campbell on EWTN, and she said for her, she being somewhat younger than either of us, um, she, she said that for her the popes were, you know, St. Peter and then John Paul II. And so this whole idea of transitioning from pope to pope, there was a little bit of a kind of emotional dis-ease about it. What, talk a little bit about that. First of all, uh, I was almost certain that this would be the first time I would be older than a pope. Uh, but it didn't happen. Yeah. I'm a little bit younger than uh, Pope Francis I. Uh, we went through a long period between John Paul II and Benedict the 16th, although that was preceded by a very short period of 33 days between Jean Paul I and Jean Paul II. Skewed the average there. <laughs> yeah. But for those who, you know, weren't involved in the church or weren't even born prior to Jean Paul II's accession to the papacy, yes, uh, this is unusual. We, we had Benedict eight years ago, and all of a sudden, in church's time, we have another conclave. Uh, so you do see a transition and uh, the difference this time, of course, is that the previous pope, Benedict XVI, resigned. Never happened in church history for that reason. We've had popes that resigned for other reasons, four or five of them only, but never a pope because of health or in, in, in increasing weakness of his physical strength would resign. So now we have a pope who is in the Vatican kind of hidden, Benedict XVI, Pope Emeritus, and a new pope who is actively Bishop of Rome, what does that mean? One thing it means is that the important part of the papacy is not the person, but the office. It is the office of Peter, which is being exercised by whoever it is that's in the see of Peter. So I think it's actually uh, kind of a good thing spiritually that we see Benedict, who's still a father. He's still a holy father. He's still Pope Benedict. I mean, they call him emeritus, but you know something? When he dies, he'll be Pope Benedict, right? Right. So... He's not Pope Benedict now, but when he dies, he will be? No, he's Pope Benedict. But he'll be there kind of as a grandfatherly presence, I would say, in the Curia. Well, maybe a, even a great-grandfatherly presence. Great-grandfatherly, yeah. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of talk about the, you know, the kind of pope we need, and, and do we need a world evangelizer? Do we need a crack the skulls kind of pope? I don't know uh, how, we're going, how the pontificate of Francis is going to unfold, but at the very least, um, we, we're probably not going to see the same kind of prolific pope that we saw in Pope Benedict. And as publishers, there's, there's some questions that could be raised on our end, but I, you know, I was listening to you talk about this earlier, uh, and, and coming from you as a publisher, it, you gave a kind of surprising uh, comment. Talk a little bit what, about... What did I say? <laughs> well, what do you think about the idea that we, we may not have as prolific a pope? Uh, I think, and I believe I said it in our previous interview here before the conclave took place, that we had a, a period of gigantic theologians in the mid-20th century. De Lubac, von Balthasar Boyer, Congar, Ratzinger, Rahner. After which we had many good theologians who drew from that great heritage of those giants. 
Then we had two gigantic popes, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and I think now we're going to have a pope who will draw on their heritage. Now, uh, Pope Francis I has a doctorate, which he got in Germany, and therefore he has scholastic scholarly abilities. Jesuits, you know, are very slow learners. We spend 14 or 15 <laughs> years in our formation process. Uh, but that does give us some, you know, acquaintance with academic affairs. But I don't think this pope will be a professor pope. Mm. The pope is priest, prophet, and king. As far as prophets go, I mean, John Paul II and Benedict XVI uh, were great speakers of the word. A prophet is one who speaks in the name of God, not telling the future necessarily, but speaking in God's name. And they did that beautifully. I think Francis will too, but I don't think as prolifically as you say. And even in a sense, uh, Benedict XVI was less prolific than Jean Paul II when it came, came to encyclicals. Right. But Benedict was such a great preacher that those Wednesday audiences, I mean, right. they became Very books rich, one right. after the other. Plus he had an existing body of material that people became acquainted with as a result of him becoming Pope. We already had 40 right. of his books in print by the time he was made Pope. Yes, yeah, so he brought his heritage with him. Uh, as far as priest, I think that uh, Pope Benedict was, uh, was more specifically a liturgical Pope than John Paul II was. Uh, the liturgy was of greater central interest to Benedict XVI. You saw it in the way the papal masses were celebrated. Of course, his, his masterpiece of a book, the Spirit of Liturgy, uh, will be um, with us as a classic for all time. And I'm not sure where Francis I stands here, but I'm sure he's not going to reverse, uh, roll back uh, the improvements that were made under Benedict the XVI. Then it comes to King, and that is administration and being, and being a leader. On the one hand, both John Paul II and Benedict XVI were great leaders in the sense of being able to speak to large groups, to speak eloquently, to make people listen to them. Uh, but to me, the most important characteristic of an administrator as leader, or leader as administrator, is the people that you hire. Mm. And under John Paul II, I think the epistle appointments were improved much from previous years. Right. But under Benedict XVI, I think they were improved even more. And with Cardinal Ouellette, now no, not Pope, but he'll be prefect, I presume, of the Congregation of Bishops, I think we'll continue to have very, very good, strong, holy, articulate, courageous bishops around the world. Certainly here in California and the West Coast, we've been abundantly blessed in the last two or three years with the new appointments. And that's been true of other places around the country. So I think that that is the key to a successful papacy for the long run because popes can't run dioceses. Bishops are in charge of dioceses and in the seminaries. And in the seminaries, they form the young priests. So when you have a good bishop, you have a healthy church for 25 years. You have more vocations. You have better formed priests. You have a liturgy, which is more reverent. The life of the faithful becomes energized. So I'm, I'm old enough to be a cynic, but I have to say, uh, with John Paul II, then Benedict, and now Francis I, I am very optimistic for the real life of the church, especially on the west coast of the U.S. and in the U.S. Well, this is the first day of Francis's pontificate. Yes. We're opining about what may happen in the future. As you like to point out, the future is unknown, and that's, that's just the way it is. But we, we have a lot of reason, a lot of hope uh, that going forward we're going to continue to see the action of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Father. Yes, I know you're trying to wrap up, but you, let me you're say, right. <laughs> say something about that. I mean, remember, even we were caught by surprise. Yes. We thought, honestly, that we had a good chance of having one of our authors, right. uh, Cardinal Ouellette, Cardinal Schoenborn, Cardinal Lorenzo, Cardinal Pell, all were candidates of the elected Pope. Didn't happen. But because there was no one who stood above the crowd like Ratzinger did in 2005, I thought it quite likely we'd have a long conclave as the Cardinals tried to assess each other right. and it's began reasonable. to vote for different people and gradually they would evolve into having an idea of who the candidate should be. They want to be elect with a two-thirds majority. And something which was not mentioned much, if at all, before the conclave, yeah, it takes 77 to become Pope. It takes 39 to block it. And 
very easily you could have had a group of cardinals who said, we don't want a pope from outside Europe, or we don't want a pope who doesn't speak Italian, or we don't want a pope who's, right. uh, you know, of Italian origin. It could be anything like that. And they would go for a compromise candidate. It would take some time. This pope was elected in only five ballots. That's a very short time. They also knew him because he was a very strong candidate in the last conclave in 2005. And all of the electors were appointed either by John Paul II or by Benedict XVI. So to me, it would be very, very unusual if Francis I did not follow in the footsteps of the two giants who went before him. So we must pray for him. Wasn't that beautiful? At first, it sounded like he was asking the people to bless him before he blessed the people. Mm -hmm. But read it carefully. That's not what he said. He said, let's have a moment of silence. Before I bless you, I want you to pray to God to bless me. I need your prayers. Right. So he wasn't saying that I can be blessed by you, because the blessing always goes from the superior to the inferior. Right. That's right. You know? But he said, I want you to pray that God will bless me in my pontificate. And he stopped for a moment of prayer. I mean, that was very, very beautiful. But we must therefore listen to him and pray for him. And I think we're going to have another exciting time in the church. Aren't we proud to be Catholics after John Paul II, Benedict XVI, with all the troubles in the church, that men like that can be raised to the highest honors in the church, and now Francis I. Well, Father, thank you very much, and we'll keep praying and we'll keep working. Amen.